So one of the main philosophies that Max talks about is making sure that the song is instantly recognizable in the first few seconds, which also helps in making the song more memorable. Probably the best and most famous example of this is his first ever number one hit, Baby One More Time, which starts with the iconic piano riff. As well as acting as an identifier at the start of the track, it acts as a song's fingerprint, appearing throughout the track to take us from one section to the next. Another great example, and another number one hit, is the intro of It's Gonna Be Me, <coughs> excuse me, It's Gonna Be May by NSYNC. Once again, super recognizable as soon as it starts playing. It's possible that this approach of adding riffs to pop songs was inspired by his time spent in a rock band. And while he doesn't do it to such an extreme degree later in his career, he does use this next trick very often. People are more likely to respond to things that are familiar to them. And with the chorus being the big payoff in a pop song, the stakes are high. So in order to make sure that the listener's ears are ready, Max often reveals the chorus vocal melody either in the intro or somewhere in the verse. An example of this is Backstreet Boys' Everybody, which uses the chorus melody as the intro. Note that it also uses the idea of recognizable riffs, a riff which nowadays people sing as often as they do the vocal melody due to its catchiness. Everybody, rock your body. Another more subtle example is Into You by Ariana Grande, where the first half of the melody in each phase of the verse is the same as the first half of the big final phrase in the choruses, where she repeats the title of the song. I'm so into you, I can barely breathe. And perhaps the most extreme example is Katy Perry's E.T., where the melody in the first half of the choruses is identical to the verses, but they're separated by the pre-chorus with a different melody so that listeners don't get bored. Max said in an interview that he learned this from Prince, when he noticed that the choruses sounded fresh when placed after a pre-chorus, despite being exactly the same as the verses of the song, and it's a technique that has served him well in his career. The melodies that Max writes are also not random. His melodic rhythm is very, very calculated, and he often uses lines that mirror each other with different lyrics in order to solidify the melody. Bonnie McKee, a songwriter who worked with Max often in the second half of his career, said, A line has to have a certain number of syllables, and the next line has to be its mirror image. If you add one syllable or take it away, it's a completely different melody to Max. Katy Perry's California Girls demonstrates this extremely well, especially because she sings the melodies very rhythmically. The verses are made up of four groups of two lines. The first line is made up of lyrics with one syllable, followed by three syllables. The second line is busier and is made up of eight syllables. There are a couple of exceptions to this, for example the line, there must be something in the water, which is nine syllables, but the word there is snuck in just before the first beat of the bar and the core rhythm stays the same, which is known in music as an anacrusis. The same thing happens on The Boys which makes the first group of the first line into two syllables instead of one. Let's have a listen. What? 
The same is true of the choruses, which has groups of 5, 6 and 8, followed by 5, 6 and 12, and the whole thing is repeated once again. There have also been various quotes throughout the years about how the sound of a melody is everything to Max Martin, and he'll sacrifice lyrics and grammar in order to place syllables with specific sounds onto individual notes in the melody. Max himself says that this comes from the collective experience of growing up listening to songs in English when it's not your native tongue, which makes you make up the lyrics in your head based on how they sound. While there are nonsensical lyrics in a range of the earlier songs that he wrote, the best example is perhaps Ariana Grande's Break Free, in which he refused to change the lyrics, despite Ariana saying that she wasn't happy singing it with the grammatical mistakes. While Max understands that repetition is useful for creating earworms, he also understands that the human ear can get bored quite easily. So the first verse of a song will often have a slightly different arrangement to the second one, and the last chorus will often be much bigger than the first chorus, maybe with some additional harmonies. Once again, we go to Ariana Grande to demonstrate this. Here's the first chorus of Into You. It's only got a drum pattern, a dirty bassy synth cluster, and the vocal singing the main melody with some delay and reverb effects. Even though it feels quite heavy, it also feels like there's a lot of space, especially in between words in the vocal melody. Now the second chorus. It sounds quite similar to the first, but if you listen closely to the second half especially, there are some high percussive sounds adding a lot of interest to the groove, and Ariana comes out with a few harmonies and vocalizations to fill the gaps in the main vocal melody. It's subtle, but really helps this chorus feel more groovy than the first. And then the big one at the end. The bridge actually works as a build-up to this final chorus, and the listener expects the same big sound from the previous two choruses. But Max surprises us with an anti-chorus of sorts, with the main melody singing over a kick drum, some finger snaps, and what sounds like some vocal tracks played in place of the dirty bass synth in the other choruses. As Ariana sings the Into You line in the first half, everything but her voice drops out. But then we realize the second half is the true big payoff, and everything comes back in with full force, with Ariana doing many harmonies and vocalizations over the top to really punch you in the face. As you can hear, it's the same chorus at its core, but with a few tweaks and added parts, Max is able to make each chorus sound fresh as well as bigger, and keep the listener engaged until the very end. For Max, simplicity is everything. 
and both his melodies and his arrangements tend to reflect that. He uses classic production techniques like sparse verses and big choruses, but even then, there are only really a handful of parts going on at one time. The same is true when looking at what parts come in and out, and while it may not be a hard and fast rule, you won't often find lots of parts being introduced at once from one section to the next, and often the drums stay exactly the same. Here is Blinding Lights by The Weeknd, which has the distinction of being the most commercially successful track that Max has worked on. Let's first take a listen to the verse. It has a driving, synthwave-inspired drum beat, a stop-start, pounding bass line, which has more of a modern vibe to it, a repeated synth arpeggio floating in the background, and the main vocal. Of course, I haven't seen the project file for this song, and I bet there are a ton of individual tracks, with the bass and the drums especially being composed of many layers, but ultimately, there are only four distinct instrumental parts in this verse. In the second half of the verse, we get a syncopated, plucky guitar part in the right ear that adds a little bit of extra energy, but everything else stays the same. A couple of reverbed claps takes us to the pre-chorus, but the drums quickly settle back into the same beat. The floating synth opens its filter a little and becomes more prominent, also possibly playing a different part from in the verses. The plucky guitar that appeared in the second half disappears, and there's a little vocal stab that emphasizes the first beats of the bar. Other than that, the instrumentation stays the same, and yet you can feel it building in energy, mostly in part due to the main vocal melody climbing higher than in the verse. Okay, now onto the chorus. Once again, the pre-chorus ends with a little vocal break and the reverb clap hits from before. But even there, the drum beat thunders on. The chorus is extremely similar to the other sections, with the vocal, the bass synth, and the drums being exactly the same as before. The floating synth is replaced with a synth that plays chords at the same time as the bass synth, and there's a slightly groovy electronic hi-hat that adds energy with eighth notes. The second half appears to add another layer of synths to the background, playing harmonies, but nothing else changes. Let's take a listen. So as you can hear, Max can fill out the sonic space with just a handful of very well-crafted parts. And the lack of major arrangement changes avoids distracting the listener, and cements the vocal, and by extension the melody, as the star of the show. Now having heard all of that, you might be tempted to believe the old saying that pop music is formulaic, but not every technique is used in every song, and not every song sounds the same. So it's more useful to think of these as tools and it's the producer's job to use the right tools in the right situation. Max has been able to use this toolbox to adapt to the artist, the genre, and the music landscape at the time, all while creating catchy and engaging tunes with mass appeal, and that perhaps is his most useful tool, and what sets him apart from all the other talented producers that have come and gone. If you want to learn more about the story of Max Martin, and how he became the powerhouse that he is today, then make sure to check out this video. And I'll see you next time on Mixed Signals. Bye-bye.